has been a fundamental principle of the American way. To true believers, the teachings of their religion provide the highest authority for faith and conduct. When a man has to accept some other authority for his moral behavior, as he must under a dictatorship, his freedom of religion is destroyed. From the beginning, America has beckoned to men and women of all religions. We must preserve in this land the right of every individual to discover God in his own way. In America, nearly all of us are investors. When we save money, we invest it one way or another. We may invest it directly in a business of our own or buy stocks or bonds. We may deposit it in a bank or buy building and loan shares or a life insurance policy. And these agencies in turn invest our savings for us. Anyone who saves in any of these forms is an investor. There are more than eight and a half million shareholders in American industry and 70 million who have savings accounts plus the 86 million who hold insurance policies. Added up, it means every family has a stake in this nation's investments. At the Keystone Steel and Wire Company in Peoria, Illinois, power plant superintendent Walter Gama, like many another civic-minded executive, is working on a community problem, the smoke problem. He's got it licked here at Keystone, but his goal is an inexpensive answer for schools and other institutions that can't install costly smoke arresters. First step, a detecting device that can measure even a puff on a cigarette. This will detect excessive smoke in a stack all right. And here, put together by high school students under Walter's direction, is the gadget that will eliminate it. It's a high-speed blower that will stir up the smoke just over the fire in the furnace, causing much more thorough combustion. So the fuel is consumed in the furnace instead of shooting up the stack as smoke or fly ash. The photoelectric cell keeps an eye on the inside of the stack. Too much smoke? The blower is automatically started. A whirlwind is brewed up in seconds. Almost instantly, the smoke meter drops. Here's what happens inside the stack. Outside, this is the result. No medals have been struck for Walter Gomer, and as far as he's concerned, it's part of the job of any good citizen to contribute his own special skills to community problems. His company, which paid for installation of the equipment in several local hospitals, wants no medals either. The payment to all who took part in the project is a city with a smog reduction record of 95% in only one year. Manhattan's East 50s. Fountainhead of high fashion in the millinery world. Now the full equal of Paris when it comes to setting the styles for women's hats. At salons like that of Lily Dachet, Madame can spend anything the bank account will allow, and you can't honestly say she isn't getting her money's worth. Passing over this head, and in putting the creation together, there's no stinting, of course, on costly imported materials, nor on time. Madame will simply have to wait. She's paying for the best, and she is going to have it. To a male eye, they're flimsy things to cost so much. But no need to ask our women folk how they feel about it. Just look at the statistics. American women buy 100 million hats a year. The vast bulk of them come not from the atelier of firms like Lily Dachet, but from the big, lower price millinery production centers. Here in New York's garment district, we visit the workrooms of a typical hat maker in this field, Beechhurst Hats Incorporated. Back there in the corner is Miss Betty Kramer, the company's designer, its eyes and ears, as it were. And always, those eyes and ears are trained on the products of the uptown salons, as well as the salons across the Atlantic. From what they produce, she must decide which styles will catch on, and she must do it in time to ride the fashion tide before it ebbs. This young lady, in large part, determines what the firm will turn out. And once the decisions have been made, they are almost irrevocable. For production begins months ahead of the season. Straw braids, mostly synthetic straws these days, 
are sewn round and round into basic hat bodies. Pairing the tension on the straw with his fingers as it feeds into the machine, he can make it lie flat, indent it, shape it almost any way he pleases. The hat body, with much of its final shape already built into it, is now steamed to prepare it for the more exact shaping. It's drawn over a wooden style block, pulling they call this. Actually, it's the blocking process. The style block inside is a Chinese puzzle sort of affair that can be taken out in pieces so as not to stretch the hat out of shape during its removal. Making the style blocks to the designer's specifications is an art in itself, one of many that go into the things we men tend to regard as so much fluff. Next, the hat is trimmed of excess straw and worked into the lines which, from the very beginning, it was intended to have. A little steaming will set the folds. And now it's ready for the addition of headband, lining, and the rhinestones, ribbon, or whatever trimming will be used to give it that extra something. The Colonel's Lady or Judy O'Grady, they can both be chic, in style, and mighty pretty to look at, whatever price they may pay. Industry on Parade visits Keene, New Hampshire, to look in on a company whose product is about as specialized as any to be found. Here at Miniature Precision Bearings Incorporated, tubes of high carbon chrome steel are turned, ground, lapped, burnished, and honed into bearings, some of which are small enough to replace the jewels in a watch. One word in the firm's title is miniature, but even more important is that other word, precision. And applying precision to parts as tiny as these calls for considerable know-how. Actually, these are the races for the largest bearings turned out in the plant. And here, coming out of a centerless grinder, is a stick of races for the smallest bearings. They have an outside diameter of only one-tenth of an inch. Races are the inner and outer holders between which balls will roll to decrease friction, a function necessary with every imaginable sort of machine, whether it be a 10-ton truck or a dentist's drill. Machining miniature bearings to precision tolerances means not only getting them down to the right dimensions, but also eliminating any waviness or roughness on all surfaces, inside and out. They have to take a considerable load and for prolonged periods. Bearings in a gyro compass, for example, may run continuously for many months on end. Here, grooves in the races are polished, a job that requires a watchmaker's loop most of the time. The tiny balls for the bearings are as close to being perfect spheres as our metalworking industries can make them. And that's pretty close. Here we see them being installed in the outer race. The inner race will go in later. No job for a person with the shakes. With the balls all in place, the inner race is fixed in place. There have been repeated tests and inspections, of which this is the last. Any bearing not up to specifications is destroyed. There can be no seconds in circulation, endangering the performance of the critical instruments in which they might be used. For the precision jobs these bearings will have to perform, it's either perfection or nothing.
St. James Episcopal Church in Albion, Michigan. They had a church fair here a year or so ago, and this was the contribution of parishioners Carter and Palmer, stuffed animals that looked like no real beasts that ever lived, but brought considerable revenue for the fair. Afterward, the ladies got to thinking, and as it turned out, that church fair was the birthplace of a new company. On the advice of a retired advertising man, they went into business. First, they called on a local dressmaker, Mrs. Reed, and got her to cut the cloth for coverings. The material was blanket remnants at first, but as sales rose, they were able to buy material by the bolt, which meant lower costs. As sales rose further, the firm which gave its strange animals equally strange names like Zoo Lamb, Zulifant, and Zoo Baboon took on extra help. This is how the job of stuffing the animals with Kapok was done at first, slowly and rather painfully. Today, any of the girls can stuff a Zoo Lamb in 20 seconds flat. But that's how businesses are born. At first, all trial and error low production, high costs, and little profit, but plenty of fun. More stuffing, gal. You'll get the knack. And as you do, there'll be machines to help, like the one that makes buttons for eyes and noses. With their growing menagerie, they found their market growing too. Now partners Carter and Palmer are scouting the countryside, looking for room in which to expand. It's only a barn, but many a great organization started with a far less impressive base of operations. Mrs. Palmer, you and Mrs. Carter look like a team that's on its way.